Hi, welcome to episode 26 of The Teacher's Promise. I'm your host, Brett Hansen, and I'm proud to celebrate, inspire, and nurture educators around the world by sharing the inspiring stories of compassionate people. This week, I discussed the heart of education with one of the kindest teachers and individuals I've ever met, Corey Vandertai. Corey's dedication to his students and community is almost legendary in Northeast Wisconsin, at least to every student, parent, colleague, and administrator he's ever worked with. This episode will provide you with good advice and a good role model, but more importantly, it will introduce you to a wonderful person who loves all kids, no matter who, no matter where, no matter what. Let's get to it. So this week we have a wonderful guest, um, a teacher, principal, uh, great citizen, um, father that, that I've known for quite a long time. And it's been my intention to get him on the show since the very beginning, since I first started. Uh, but he's a really busy guy with an amazing family. And um, so we finally got him on the show. It's my great pleasure to introduce all of you to Corey Vandertai. Welcome to the show, Corey. How you doing? Thank you, Brett, so much. Uh, everything is great, and it's great to be able to have a, this opportunity to talk to you. Um, just so people know, uh, Corey has been an extraordinary teacher in Northeast Wisconsin for a very long time in a lot of different ways, which we will get to in the show. But um, I'm, I'm really excited to have him here. So, Corey, why don't you just tell everybody a little bit about yourself and how you got into teaching, your experience, or anything you think is interesting about your path? All right. Well, I, I grew up in a rural community. I'm, I'm a farm boy um, and just so, so thankful for the opportunity to grow up on a dairy farm with my mom and dad and three other siblings. I actually have a twin brother. We we're the youngest of four. Um, and growing up on a farm, I mean, I think it laid the foundation for so many life lessons around hard work and dedication, uh, being part of something bigger than yourselves, the importance of, you know, sticking together. And I think that that has really um, carried on well in my career as an educator um, and laid a strong foundation. I was actually the first in my family to attend college. Um, I graduated from UW Stevens Point in 1997 uh, in elementary education. And another passion of mine that kind of developed starting in fifth grade all the way through my school years um, with a dance education minor, which automatically made things a little bit unique as I applied for positions. Um, I taught 14 years uh, teaching in the Howard Swamical School District, more of a suburban school district um, in Northeast Wisconsin, and then predominantly um, in the Southern Door County School District, a more rural area, uh, again, for 14 years. I had an opportunity to go back to school uh, through Viterbo and earn my master's degree in educational leadership and uh, became an administrator for the first time in 2012. Uh, serving as a principal in the Green Bay Area Public School District at Eisenhower Elementary, and then also served um, for a short time in Pulaski, and then most recently as an administrator and elementary school principal in Southern Door. When I think about, you know, becoming an educator, like many listeners, um, you know, I had so many wonderful experiences with teachers um, growing up, through, I would say, through elementary, middle, and high school. And I really felt their positive impact. You know, I felt the warmth, the care, the nurturing that I needed. Um, I was always the shy kid in school, believe it or not. And I would often share that with my the students that I had when I was a classroom teacher. Uh, you know, struggled with reading all the way through fourth grade. I remember getting pulled out of class and the feeling of, you know, not wanting to be pulled out and everyone staring at me, where are you going? Uh, but that really changed in fourth grade, a uh, special teacher that I had. And suddenly it just had this drive to want to read more and, and discovered a strong interest in reading and finally developed the confidence uh, to be able to kind of just propel me through school. And I think it was even through that example where it's like, I wanted to be that teacher. I wanted to help the underdogs, the kids who maybe it didn't come easy for them. And uh, that was one of the reason why I just wanted to become an educator to make a difference. Uh, I think by the time yeah. I got to high school, uh, at the time we had a s elementary school counselor, Mrs. Jan, and every year she'd organize a career day. And uh, my junior and senior year, she had welcomed me 
to join uh, to share my passion for dance. And I think through the teaching of those classes and seeing the excitement of the kids and the feeling that I had to share that with others uh, really solidified, like I wanted to be an elementary school teacher. I wanted to work with kids. Uh, I wanted to see that joy and excitement of learning and um, share that with others. So I've always had a love of learning, as I would say, since fourth grade up to that point, I did it because, you know, it was what you did and, but it, it didn't always come easy. And uh, I think that that helped me develop a little bit more empathy for kids in elementary school as I work with them that, Hey, it doesn't have to always come easy, but if you continue to work hard, set your mind to it, have a good work ethic, like, Hey, you could become a teacher like me and be teaching a future generation. Yeah. We had a previous guest, Karen Riddle, who talked about um, how much she learned by helping her son uh, who struggled with reading when he was young and he's a, he's a doctor or oh, he's, a, he's finishing up, he's working through his medical school now. I'm sorry. He's in uh, medical school. So it really is true with the right teacher, with the right leader, with someone who believes in you, you can, you can get over any of those hurdles. So great job. And you, you were just talking about empathy and having that empathy. Um, what role does empathy or compassion play in your life? Not, not just as a teacher, because you know, now you're, um, you know, a dedicated parent, but what role does compassion or empathy play in your life? I think it's just, you know, recognizing, I think most importantly that I think in general in life, I mean, people want to do well. Um, I don't think anyone wakes up in the morning, regardless of their career or their task for the day, whether you're a student or an adult, you know, and says, you know, today I want to do as poorly as I can, you know, I, I, I want to be miserable and I want to fail. Everyone wants to, to do well, to, to succeed, uh, to feel good at what they're doing. And I said, so I think just seeing that in others and recognizing that um, you can play an important role in helping them, you know, succeed and um, achieve what they want to be, you know, whether it's, at a factory job of helping them feel encouraged and that they're making a difference to the products that they're making for the lives of others to make it simpler or in the classroom where you're helping spark a new interest in a topic that a kid is excited to learn about. I think it's seeing the yeah. good in others. Um, and, and that's, that's, I guess, tied back to recognizing that we all want to do well. We all want to feel appreciated. We all want to feel uh, valued and, and recognized for the good that we bring to the world. Yeah. Yeah. My wife is extremely empathetic. She's a, a, a you know, always has been a compassionate heart. And I, when I was young, I was pretty selfish. Um, and so for me, it's, it's still a constant struggle, but that, that goal to help other people reach their potential, that goal to see joy in other people when you help them a little bit or a lot. Um, it really is a wonderful feeling. And, you know, one of the great things about being an educator is you get to to do it every day. So, yeah, I think, you know, yeah. in the, it, we live in such a fast paced society that, you know, that me mentality, sometimes can, it's easy to take over. You know, I always joke yeah. that even fast food today is you know, not fast enough. You know, it's got to be quick, instant gratification. And I think, you know, when you live in that world, it's easy to um, lose that connection that you need from others, um, that it's not just about you, but it's really your life is fulfilled by the connections you make with other people um, yeah. and, and how you lift them up. Yeah. So how, how do you, how, is there, was it any different for you, uh, like lifting people, students, whether that, you know, teachers as an uh, administrator, as a principal or students as a teacher yourself in the different places you taught in the suburbs of, I think you said Howard Suamico and then the rural community of Southern Door versus the, you know, small inner city community of Green Bay. Was there a big difference? Did you notice any difference? I mean, in general, I didn't think the kids were a lot different. I think probably the experiences that they had before they entered those school doors uh, was what was different. You know, and I yeah. worked in um, more of the suburban, even Howard Swamico, I taught Howard Elementary School. That was the highest poverty school within the district. And I think that, you know, the, the kids were, like I said, were the same. You know, they, they wanted to do well. They wanted to belong. They wanted to play. They wanted to learn. Um, they may have just had that disadvantage of not necessarily being set up 
in those early ch childhood days, you know, prior to school, yeah. not, and I would say not because, you know, they didn't have parents who cared or loved them because I believe they did. Uh, they, I, I just don't think they necessarily had the resources, um, access to materials. You know, I think about my time in, in Green Bay, when I transitioned to Green Bay, you know, oftentimes people would say, wow, you know, that must be a really difficult school to teach in, you know, the kids must be really rough. And, and I, I absolutely loved my time in Green Bay Area Public Schools. You know, I loved the diversity. And what I found is these students that had so little um, in terms of resources, materials, access to learning opportunities before school were actually the most eager to want to learn. Um, yeah. and, you know, and I think about, it was a bilingual school. So, um, dual immersion school, Spanish, most over 50% of the population was Spanish speaking. So they were learning two languages at the same time. Part of the day was taught in Spanish. Part of the day was taught in English. And when I think about, you know, the grit and resiliency that we talk about today, that these kids had as kindergartners, first graders, all the way through fifth grade, you know, I always told them, you should be proud of what you're accomplishing. You know, you're going to leave elementary school speaking two languages. And it wasn't yeah. always easy, but I, I just, I applaud that student population because I don't think, I think it's oftentimes easy for students and families in maybe more affluent areas or even rural areas where there's still poverty, but it's not at the same degree, really to take education for granted. Uh, they, yeah. and I think sometimes they forget how fortunate they are to be able to, you know, have these learning opportunities and yeah, it's, it, it's very different. Uh, but like I said, I would say kids, kids are kids, no matter where you go. Yeah. I think that's really true. I, I take things for granted nowadays. I've caught myself last few weeks, just, you know, you know, realizing how I lose my focus and, you know, I have this wonderful career that I, I enjoy and, you know, my family has plenty of money my kids are healthy and happy and everything's good. So yeah, it's really important that we do that. Um, we have some students at my school right now uh, more than we, we had in the past from that have, you know, worked hard with either themselves or their families. They've, they've come up all the way from Honduras to, you know, try to build a better life. And, you know, they speak very little English and um, I really like saying hi to them. I, I speak some Spanish, not very well, but they love it when you, when you, you know, practice their language. I, I'm very impressed with anyone who goes to school and learns in two different languages at the same time, because that's, that's quite an accomplishment. So that's good stuff. What about um, your parenting now? I mean, the, the empathy, compassion, how has switching from being a teacher and, and a principal to being a dedicated parent of three. Um, how has that changed you? How has that made you either, you know, a better person or a different person? Um, cause you know, being a parent is so much like being a teacher and vice versa. Um, how, how, how has that been for you? I think one of the big ahas for me uh, because my my our family has grown significantly here just in the last year and a half. Um, my wife and I decided to uh, to look at getting licensed for foster to adopt. So looking at you know bringing kids into our home uh, who are looking for a forever. Family. Excuse me one second, Corey. I have to interrupt. For those of you out there listening, of course Corey Vanderty became a foster parent. Of course <laughs> he adopted. Everybody who knows Corey knows that this is no surprise at all. So I just want to say, wonderful. Thank goodness there are people like you who are doing this regularly. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just had to say something. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Brett. Yeah, I mean, I think just being in education. Um, I think I was able to see things from a different perspective and to see this this big need out there where kids were bouncing from foster home to foster home and looking for a forever family. And my wife and I, when we got married, decided that, you know, perhaps we were going to focus our energy on, on identifying some children who are looking for their forever family and why not that be us. And so um, I used to be that teacher, you know, that would often, people would say like, you know, 
looking to have children in the future, be married in the future. And I would be the one to say, like, I already have all the kids I want. You know, I looked at my class as my family. I mean, it wasn't just learning during the day. It was, you know, attending their swim meets or their Taekwondo competition or a football game. And those were my kids. I think what has really, uh, the aha for me was, you know, being a parent, I think it's, it is different. I, I, I think that that was something that I said and there were times when parents would say things like, well, you don't, you don't get it. You don't understand because you're not a parent. And I kind of scoffed at that. Like, of course I know. And really I didn't. And I think about in my parent role right now, you know, I think there were probably times as a teacher and even an administrator that I probably was a little bit more judgmental than I should have been on parents you know, either thinking that they didn't care or why, why aren't they helping their children with this or why aren't they getting them to this parent event? This is important. So I think being a parent now, um, I think I've just discovered that it's, you know, while my wife and I are continuing to prepare our foster kids for the best possible outcome, you know, preparing them for school, we know that there's a chance that despite those efforts, the students may still have challenges, whether it's academic or mental or uh, social, emotional. Um, so I think it's just helping me step back to say, like, we're working really hard, probably just like all the other parents that I've worked with in the past were working really hard. And sometimes despite those efforts, it still wasn't enough. So I think it's important. You know, one of the things I've learned is just if I was to go back to be a teacher or administrator today is probably to be less judgmental because it's hard to really fully understand every person's situation. And I think being a parent now has really kind of opened my eyes to that. Yeah. My mom was a single parent and she never went to any of my events that I can remember. I didn't have that many. Um, and uh, I, I kind of judged her for that. I'm, I'm certain that some teachers did, but she worked so hard just to make sure we had enough money and things like that. I know exactly what you're saying. I, I try to work on that too. Um, try to, not be judgmental and just, you know, do my job, help the kids as much as I possibly can. So it's a really good lesson. I think I even discovered that being a principal, you know, especially the last several years when we we're working on sub shortages and COVID and, and figuring out how we're going to cover classrooms, you know, even the most basic thing like doctor's appointments, you know, I think I was the one maybe to be more judgmental of why are they scheduling them during the day and why can't they schedule them after school? And when my wife was uh, expecting our own biological son, you know, that was when I discovered, yeah, you know, the doctor set these times and you can't go at four thirty, five 5 o'clock. Uh, even those little things about seeing a bigger perspective and bigger, um, having a better understanding that, Again, it's not that anyone's doing that kind of stuff intentionally, but, you know, sometimes things are out of their control and to have even more empathy in, in recognizing that, you know, those are the circumstances and working through it and honoring that. So what about um, one of the teachers that you think has done all this stuff well? Who, who really influenced you? Could you tell us about one of the kindest or most positively memorable teachers you've ever had? One or two, it's up to you. Yeah, well, I feel like, I don't know if, I, if it's like saying I'm the lucky one, but I I actually loved all of my teachers. I, I can't say a bad word about anyone, you know, that's elementary through middle through high school. So if there's anyone out there listening that was a teacher of mine, um, please know that I really respected and, and valued every single one of you for what you contributed to my life. I would say that the, the one person that really stands out to me is uh, one of my high school teachers, Mrs. Mary Grison. Um, she was uh, my high school choral teacher. And I don't think I fully realized it until later in life, which I think is, it happens often, right? You never know who you're really impacting because it's often not in the moment that they tell you or that you know what's going to happen. But when I think back to my high school years and Mrs. Mary Grison, um, she just had such a knack of marrying high expectations um, with a loving heart. Um, she expected so much of us as students and as musicians, and she pushed us. And some might have seen that as, wow, she's like almost over pushing you. But I feel like she got us to achieve 
and exceed what any of us ever thought was possible. You know, we could have set the bar at a certain level and she saw even more in us. So her level was always set higher. And oftentimes we would not just achieve it, but exceed that. Um, when I was a senior in high school, first of all, I should say our, our school was had a high reputation, strong reputation for um, high school musicals. Um, and that was historical um, for our community and just put on high caliber shows. And my senior year, uh, actually the summer of my, right after I finished my junior year, she actually asked if I would serve as the choreographer uh, for the musical Oklahoma, my senior year. And when I think back now as an adult looking back, that was a huge risk, you know, to put a high school student in that kind of leadership position. Um, I didn't have a lot of formal training. You know, I had spent two summers with the kids from Wisconsin, uh, a musical group here in the state. And uh, a lot of the kind of dance technique, I honestly learned through that, you know, things like tapping and clogging. And um, I went ahead and did it. And I think about, again, the risk that she took, but she obviously believed in me. And when I think back to those days, um, I, I'm just so grateful to her that for, for seeing something in me that, that maybe I didn't see myself and, and would have doubted whether I could possibly do that. And that really then set the stage for me really to go on to college and, and select dance education as my minor, which is, again, a little uncommon, uh, but had then the opportunity, so many opportunities that followed that to choreograph musicals for other high schools, um, a couple technical schools, and then even back in my hometown, um, serving as choreographer for different shows. So again, that love for her students and high expectations and just truly believing in me. She She's definitely changed my life and my path and um, so grateful to her. That's great. So did she let you know like ahead of time, like the summer before? She did. Yeah, she actually had yeah. planted the seed. And I think, you know, <laughs> a lot of the summer I kept thinking, oh my gosh, can I do this? Can I, can I really yeah. choreograph this? And I was going to be in the show myself. So not only was I playing one of the lead characters, but I was going to be asked to teach choreography to my peers, um, which, you know, pre presented some challenges in itself. Uh, but yeah, she, some people are just gifted, Corey. Some people are just gifted to be teachers. So that's you. <laughs> You're too kind. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, and do you still, are you still in touch with her? Do you have her email? Do you contact her? Do you Facebook with her or anything like that? Oh yes. Yep. She was actually one of the first people that I reached out to, uh, when my wife and I started fostering, you know, cause she was kind of like my school mom. Uh, so she, yeah, she's been a special part of my life for many years, and she's always followed me um, through my education career, whether it was at UW Stevens Point and different productions I was in there. Um, actually, I had the opportunity when I came back to my home school, Southern Door, to teach. Uh, my first several years, uh, we got to uh, work together as colleagues, which was which was beautiful in itself too. We got to direct show choir together and. Uh, multiple high school musicals that followed. So we were able to to maintain that special connection and we still keep in touch. Well, that's great because you're going to have to get in touch with her again to let her know so she can hear this because it's going to melt her heart. I'm certain of it. She's <laughs> going to she's gonna tear up if she does that at all. So um, so it's, usually I'll often ask guests to you know tell us something about why people should become educators, but I mean, you've already talked about so many reasons. So I, I kind of want to switch this up a little bit and ask you, what do you think educators, teachers in the classroom need in order to help their students become successful? What do they need either from themselves or from the community? I think one of the biggest things, we talk a lot today about relationships and connections. And I think that um, building connections with students and their families is so critical. You know, we can we can develop a strong understanding of content and and teaching practices and use of resources and you know be good at implementing those kinds of things. But I think connections with students and families is really what is going to ensure success. You know, the teacher feeling successful like they're making a difference and really having impact on kids' learning. Um, 
you know, we often talk, yeah, when I was an administrator, we talk about all behaviors communication, you know, not not to be too quick to judge a student's behavior as being, you know, showing that they're unmotivated or that they don't care. There's always, always something deeper. And I think as teachers, um, taking the time, which I, I acknowledge can be difficult, uh, but taking the time to go a little bit deeper to figure out exactly what's going on, because I think, as I said earlier, kids want to do well. Um, they want to be successful. So connections with kids, absolutely critical. Um, I think about, you know, the importance, sometimes we focus so much on kids, but it's also connecting with the parents, you know, getting them to be, um, you know, you, you want to make sure that you're on the same team, that you're both there supporting the child and letting the, the parents know that you want to work with them. And that's not always easy. Um, but I would encourage, I think teachers just need to take the time and invest in building that connection with families. Think of an example, you know, of a student I had, I remember uh, at the end of the school year, fourth grade teachers coming up to me and saying, oh goodness, I see Collins on your class list for next year. You know, good luck with Colin and especially with his dad. And I think Colin and his dad had a, had a reputation all the way through elementary school of kind of making things difficult. Um, so of course it was my mission to figure out this is going to, I'm going to make this the best year for Colin and his dad. And it was trying to get out in the front end and not letting history repeat itself, but figuring out what can I do for Colin. Um, and it was so exciting to see Colin grow throughout fifth grade and develop the, the relationship with him and his dad uh, and then watch him grow throughout school. You know, he ended up being a state, wrestling champion for the state of Wisconsin. And I'm so honored to say that he's a teacher himself today. And um, That's I know great. That, that wouldn't have been possible without that connection. And, and again, using maybe some of that negative energy and, and put helping propel it and push it forward in a productive, positive way, instead of seeing yeah. it as a negative. Yeah, that's good advice. Very good one, advice. I think one thing that also is important to me is um, I think teachers need to remember that they have the opportunity to be the best part of someone's day or the worst part of someone's day. Um, and I know that's hard because I will acknowledge that I know I've been both. You know, I can say I feel like I've been the best part of someone's day, but there have been times where I've not been the best part. And I may have been the worst part of that person's day. Yeah, so Corey, I can imagine you being the not best part of someone's day, but it's very hard for me to imagine you being the worst part of someone's well, day. So maybe yeah, not best, maybe somewhere in the middle, but I highly doubt the worst. That's that seems unlikely. So well, I'm sorry tough. to interrupt again. <laughs> maybe we're tough critics of ourselves, but I just I know that I think just you like are, every, yeah. Every teacher, I think it just um I think it's important to remember that. Sometimes no matter how hard you try, um, you know, things may not go the way you want them to be going. Um, but remember, if you if you think about what can I do today to be the best part of someone's day, and that could include you know, a student or a colleague, um, I think that's really important for, for educators to remember, especially for students, because I often would say it's easy to be a great teacher when you're teaching kids who already get it. It's what you do with the kids who don't that really make the difference. And I think that's the difference between it being an ordinary educator or that extraordinary educator. Um, you know, what, what can you pull out of your tool bag to get to those students who are the most difficult to reach? Um, yeah. And again, that goes back to that all behaviors communication. How can you go a little bit deeper to figure out what is the root and then and support them from there so that they can feel that growth as well? So what's new for you now? You told us about your boys. You can tell us if you want a little bit more about that or what, do you, what would you like to share as we get closer here to the end of our discussion? What's new for you and what would you like to share? Yeah, well, I'm not sure. You know, obviously the listeners might not be aware that I did ended up leaving the education career here this past summer uh, to basically be a full-time, uh, I say, play-at-home dad. I get to be the principal at home <laughs> of, of three amazing little boys, um, all under age two. Um, and while it was incredibly difficult um, to leave education because it literally is, is, has been my life and it's my passion. And I know that one day 
I will return in some capacity. Um, I also know that family is super, super important to me. And um, while I acknowledge that not all families have the opportunity, you know, for a parent to stay home with their children, I was, I'm fortunate to be in a situation where that was an option. So um, my wife encouraged me and supported me to um, take a pause in my career and be a stay at home dad. So we, right now I'm, I'm happy to say that the first little boy that we were fostering, we were able to officially adopt um, just a few weeks ago. So um, he's part of yeah, our forever congratulations. family. Thank you. Yeah. Congratulations. And then we have, um, our biological son is kind of the middle child. And then we are fostering right now uh, another adorable little boy. Um, he just turned seven months old. So I would say for the next you know, four to five years, my main priority is going to be loving them up here at home and giving them the best possible start um, that they can receive and preparing them for school. And then one day returning to the school building and whether it's in a volunteer capacity or, you know, joining the staff once again, um, looking forward to that day and, and watching them grow and have amazing teachers like I've had, you know, because that's it. It makes all the difference. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just so everybody's clear. It's after 24 years, you were in education for 24 years and now you're just taking a break. Right. Yep. 14, yeah. <laughs> years as a, 14 years as a teacher and 10 years as an administrator. So yeah, nice balance, sure. but who knows, you know, like I said, people joked, you know, it was I going to, you know, obviously it's unlikely a principal opening will be available at the time, but you know, I'm, I'm so open because, you know, I have always, always have been a believer that there's no unimportant role in education. So whether it's the school bus driver, the cafeteria worker, the crossing guard, the classroom teacher, principal, I mean, Every position is so critical. So um, it kind of excites me to think, you know, perhaps going back to to be in a different position and and also probably to discover from another perspective a, a new appreciation for a different kind of role as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure that whatever you come back to do, you will do it well and deeply and the kids that are surrounded uh, that will they'll surround you and appreciate all your love and care, and it'll be awesome. But right now, you know those three little boys are are the ticket. I I personally really wanted to get you on the show. I think it's wonderful uh, for us to talk about you know someone like you who weaves almost effortlessly through children's lives in so many different capacities and ways, and it's always about love and care and love and care and compassion. And for listeners to show, you know, that's the the centerpiece of the teacher's promise is about compassion. Um, and we didn't really talk about it much in this episode, but that kind of compassion makes us better people. Um, I think it's possible that, you know, maybe Corey here has so much compassion that he doesn't sort of realize it, but for the rest of us, this kind of work um, transforms us into something better. And so you're a great role model and I appreciate um, you sharing all this stuff. Is there anything else you wanted to say to anybody before we sign off? Uh, you know, what I would share is uh, some advice that I received from a high school friend, Jamie, uh, when I was in high school, actually, during the time of choreographing Oklahoma and, you know, the the burden and high expectations I felt at that time. I remember giving her just a thinking of you card and um, the message inside was on the long list of things to take care of. Remember yourself. So yeah. I would say to, you know, to the listeners, you know, regardless of the curriculum resource you're using, the professional development you're participating in, um, all those material kinds of things, just always remember that you are the most important part um, in the children's lives and education, not necessarily the physical tools or resources. And in order to be your best self, um, you need to take care of yourself and, and not to feel like that's a selfish thing to do. So uh, for any listeners out there, you know, please add your name to the list of things to take care of so that you can give more of yourself um, to your students or your colleagues or your family um, and not, not feel not feel negative about that. You, you matter and you are the most important part in a child's life. Yeah. It's a great way to finish the show. So, um, and now we've gotten to my favorite part where I get to thank the educator. And this one is uh, long awaited 
and really easy. So uh, first, I want to uh, thank your parents for raising you on a wonderful dairy farm in the country and teaching you how to work hard and dedicate yourselves to things bigger than yourself because it's certainly paid off. If there's ever an example of paying things forward, uh, you are one. So thank you to your wonderful parents and thank you to Miss John and for for what she did for you when you were young, for the Green Bay School District, for um, bringing you in to help all those kids and for Howard Swamico District and uh, for Southern Door District. Thank you very much, Mrs. Grison, for holding you to those high expectations with a large, loving, caring heart, because that's really what it's all about. High expectations and compassion and love. And thank you, Jamie, for reminding Corey to take care of himself. If there's anybody that I've known who might not take care of himself because he's always taking care of others, it is Corey Vandertai. Thank you for your 24 years of service to kids so far, uh, Corey. Thank you for um, taking on the responsibility that so many of us just can't fit into our lives to foster children, to adopt children, um, to bring to uh, wonderful, beautiful little boys into the forever family, which will always be theirs. I just, I mean, I'm getting a little choked up here thinking about it. And thank you for being such a kind, wonderful, dedicated teacher, father, community member, and person. It's it's rare that we meet people that are this kind. And Corey Vandertai, you were one of them. So thank you very much for being on the show and being such a good person. Thank you so much, Brett. And thank you for inspiring Teachers Promise and helping lift up educators throughout throughout the nation. What a wonderful educator. I don't know that I'll ever live up to Corey's example, but that's okay. We must each care and do as much as we can and then embrace both what we give and what we get. We don't have to be perfect or the best. We just have to do our best each day and remember that all children are our children and deserve our intelligent compassion. I really hope you join us again next time in two weeks when I share a compilation of my guests' funny stories from the classroom. I promise you'll love it. And whether you return or not, never forget to take care of yourself. It's the secret to a long career of taking care of others. And if you haven't done so lately, please tell a fellow educator how important their work is. Spontaneous gratitude goes a long way. Until next time.